Hello everybody and welcome to episode 8 of Baker's Chatcast. Today we are joined by the one and only Rick Witter from legendary indie band Shed 7 and I hope you enjoy. Hello Rick, thank you for joining me and giving you time today. It's a pleasure to have you on. How have you been managing throughout the last month being in lockdown? Uh, well, thanks for having me for a start, Baker. Um, it's been as weird as it's been for everyone else, I guess, really. You know, it's just a, a life-stopping thing for a short time, wasn't it, really? So, you know, we just all look forward and, and hope that it just kind of lifts. It probably will happen slowly, but, you know, I'm just itching to get out there and do a gig, to be perfectly honest with you. I imagine you've been in a band. It will have been hard for you not to see your other bandmates for quite some time. Yeah, yeah, it's been difficult. I mean, to be honest, we only do stuff sporadically anyway, really. So, you know, we have just finished quite a big tour in December 2019, just before all of this nonsense started. So we kind of would have perhaps downed tools as a band for a few months anyway. So it wasn't too much of a shock in that respect. But then obviously when you started to realise that it was going to be a lot longer than what we'd thought possibly then yeah you start to think well you know it's it's what we do it's what we love doing just even getting together in a room and rehearsing really so so we're hoping that that might be able to happen come early summer so you know i'll just uh, just keep on waiting really and watching the rubbish on the telly yeah that's exactly the same um just just the telly at the minute but hopefully you can obviously get playing some gigs again sometime soon yeah, we did actually um, release a live album at the end of last year and that kind of kept us busy because, you know, we had to listen to loads of different concerts and cherry pick the best performances for all the, the most lively performances because um, we weren't looking to, to rule out any mistakes that might have happened because I think that's part of the gig, you know, if, if I slightly go off out of tune or whatever or a few bum notes. But that that was quite time consuming. So that kind of took the edge off a little bit in the respect that, you know, it kind of worked out perfectly, really, because people have missed seeing us play. So it's like the next best thing, I guess. You just stick it on loud in your living room, pretend you're in a field somewhere, get your wellies on, you know, get a few, get a few of your kids to bump into you like the drunk people at a festival. And we'll obviously get on to that later because it's a brilliant album. But first today, Rick, my first question is, how did you and the rest of the band meet prior um, to the release of your first album, Change Giver, in 1994? Yep, so me, Paul and Tom all went to the same school, so we met when we were 11. Um, so we'd known each other an awful long time and we'd played in various school type bands throughout our school life really. We were doing gigs in pubs when we were like 15. Um, so we'd kind of honed it, I suppose, over the years, you know, and, and uh, Alan joined just bef just as we became known as Shed Seven. Um, so we'd known each other for an awful long time, really, and just grown up as mates and just decided that we wanted to all be in a band together and started to write some stuff. You know, obviously when you're 13 and 14, it's not the best thing you're ever going to hear, but I, I think that the more you do something, the better you're going to get it. So we had a we had a good clear run from being 12, really. Who and how did the band name of Shed 7 um, first come around, as you mentioned? Right, well, Baker, we used to say, when we, were, when we were in the 90s and we were getting written about all the time, we'd get asked that question every single interview we ever did. So it got so boring by the late 90s that we vowed we'd never answer that question ever again. Or we'd come up with alternatives for the, for the real truth like Alan, our drummer, lost his virginity when he was seven in a shed, which obviously didn't happen, but that we used to say, throw that one out there. Or there used to be 11 of us, but we shed seven members, and now there's only four, because there was four of us at that point in the band. So you're not getting it. Yeah, it's, um, but um, at least you didn't do an S Club 7 and name the band after the amount of members in the band. That's very true. That wouldn't have been very good at all, would it? It would have been hideous. No. <laughs> Could, can you recall the first actual gig you played with Shed 7 after being signed on as an official band to an well, to a record company? It took us, we officially formed Shed 7 in 1990. So it took us to, I think it was November 
November 93 is when we signed and I only really remember that it's because I'd just turned 21 so that was quite a nice 21st birthday present so we'd been playing gigs as Shed 7 for a good three years before we signed um, but we wouldn't we wouldn't overplay because lots of bands like to play every week and you know you, people just stop coming if they can see you so many times so we kind of tried to play on the we'll only play three or four times a year kind of thing and then people are more likely to want to come and see you uh, so we did that a lot around york and leeds which is where we're from um and to answer your question i can't remember the, i can't really remember the first gig after we signed i can't remember it being a big grand affair i think we we probably would have played a celebratory hometown gig because we'd just signed a big six album record deal and that probably would have just been in a pub in york um i remember supporting the charlatans in stoke very early 94 i remember supporting suede in blackpool um very early on so you know because obviously we were just making our name at that point and trying to get people aware that we existed but it didn't take too long. Because I can remember Tim Burgess's listening party where um, you did share that, you did support the charlatans a couple of times. Yeah, Trent of Gardens, yeah. it was a good night like that, yeah. Very good night. As I can recall something you've said on Twitter before, the Smiths had a massive impact on you wanting to be in a band. How big was this? Uh, well, we were still at school when the Smiths split up really, we got, kind of got into them right towards the end of their career, but they only lasted about four years. So it was great to discover a band that kind of meant so much and realized that there was four or five brilliant albums to, to go back and rediscover. So it, it, there was maybe a group of us, maybe probably, uh, maybe 15 of us in our year group who liked Indian alternative music and everyone else just liked the chart stuff, your Madonnas and your Whitney and your Brosses. So we were kind of looked at as being a bit weird because we liked weird music. But we really liked that. We liked being the kind of the outsiders. So that kind of added to the, to the kind of wanting to really like the Smiths. Um, and it didn't do us any harm because it, it just introduced us to some really defining music that made us want to do similar stuff, really. And so I'm sat here now talking to you. So it's, the, the only reason I like the Smiths is so I could get to talk to you, Baker, at a future date. Well, um, it's before I was even born. Thank you for thinking of that, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as we talk about the Smiths, they're like a chain of bands because... If you think like without the Smiths, you probably wouldn't have got the Stone Roses, and mm. they've like, inspired so many bands to like this current day. To be honest, so yeah, well, had a the, lasting impact. They were very, very important because they were so different to what was happening in the mainstream music. You know, there was just and and they were, I guess quite brave, really, to kind of go against what the the popular sound was at, at the time, and I guess that's why so many people bought into it really i mean the smiths certainly morrissey with his lyrics he lifted a lot of quotes from films and stuff he was really a big fan of like late 50s early 60s black and white northern dramas and if you listen to, if you watch some of those films and then listen to some of morrissey's lyrics there's an awful lot lifted from those films um so even they stole really in a way you know we all do it Speaking about influences still, um, I asked you a couple of days for a couple of songs, two songs that helped shape your career leading up yeah. to Shed 7 and you chose The House Martins, We're Not Deep and The Stone Roses, Mercy Paradise. How much do these two songs mean to you? Well, I chose them. I mean, there's so many songs that I could think of, but I chose those because you did mention that they had to be kind of career defining. Yeah. Uh, and if we go back to when we were in school bands, me, Paul and Tom, uh, we went through a phase of loving the House Martins uh, when they came out. Because again, they were kind of different, a bit more poppy than the Smiths, but different and good lyrics. Um, and the particular band that we were in when we were about 15, um, we did a cover of uh, We're Not Deep by the House Martins. We always used to do it as part of our set because we liked it so much. 
So I chose that for that reason, really, the fact that we've done a cover of it. Yeah. Um, and the Stone Roses is, is defining because when we left school in about 1988, uh, we kind of were still kind of mucking about and still kind of young in our mentalities. And then in 1989, the Stone Roses album came out and that kind of changed everything again for us. We kind of heard that and thought, right, well, we need to stop mucking about now. This is serious. You know, that's such a great debut album. And the image of it and everything was so good and strong that we just thought, right, let's stop this school band and start again with a new name and take ourselves a bit more seriously and try and write a bit more seriously which is when 1990 we became Shed 7. And to say that Mercy Paradise is a B-side is just incredible, really. It's such a great pop song, and they chose to put it on a B-side. Not that many people now know what B-sides are, but <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, it's kind of like the spare song that you put on the flip side of your current single. It's the one that you, you try to promote. So that even to that extent made us think, right, don't just write any old rubbish to put on the single, you know, as a B-side. Think about every song you're writing about and make them as good as you possibly can, which I think in our early days of Shed 7, we did quite well at that because I think um, we released a Maximum High album with a special edition second album, which was all of our early B-sides. And, and a lot of Shed 7 fans really get into that and dig that. And I imagine people like you who are in an indie band would obviously pick the Storm Roses because they were like almost that stamp on the indie scene and that, that debut album was massive, as you say, for yeah. that music. But just the imagery of it all and, and the, you know, just bringing back a little bit of Rolling Stones-ness to stuff, you know, and, and just that cocksure attitude that Oasis took the baton from and ran with it. Um, yeah, just, you know, just it, it, it was a, a great different time for music. I mean, there was a lot of bands like that. I mean, the Stone Roses took ages before they finally hit on that. You know, they were, they were almost a goth band in about 1985 with Ian Brown wearing bandanas and things, you know. But, uh, you know, the Happy Mondays were just as important in their own way as yeah. well. Obviously, now, as you stated back in earlier, you brought out your live album, Another Night, Another Town, which I, in fact, have right here. Good lad. Which um, came out just before Christmas. and Obviously, 21 live songs recorded from Shed December 2019. Could you tell us a bit more about this? Like, the previous year when you were touring and recording, did you plan to bring this out, or was it more the situation with COVID, like not being allowed to tour, you thought it would be a good way to bring the recordings back out and release the album? Yeah, we didn't have a set plan at all. We'd, we've, over the past three or four or five years, we've just recorded every gig, not, not in any way mixed or anything, just off the desk, the front desk. We just pressed record, and then we knew that we would have a, some time in the future something to play with. Um, so there was no set plan to release that last year at all until it got to about June last year, July last year, that we thought, right, well, we're, we're in this for the long haul. So we have got lots of gigs that we can sift through and, and see, see if we can get anything out of it. And we took it all quite seriously. We got the man who produced our Maximum High album way back when to mix it for us, and he did a great job. Uh, and as I say, it just took... It took a few months because, you know, it can get quite intense listening to about 40 versions of She Left Me On Friday live, trying to pick the best one. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And that's the times that by 24 songs or however many are on there. And, th and then trying to find the bits of in-between song banter that I would say picking the right things that are relevant because a lot of what I say is a lot of old rubbish <laughs> at, at gigs and you know we didn't want to put anything on there that would date the album in any way you know what I mean we wanted it so so yeah a lot of a lot of rubbish was chopped off. I would go as far as saying it's one of the best live albums I've heard do, do you have a favourite song to play live off that album or just like a song you love playing live general in general when you do your gigs 
We are very lucky. I think we've got such what a good choice. Well, we, well, not only that, yeah, that does come into it. I mean, it is a bit of a nightmare writing set lists because there's certain songs that we wouldn't not be allowed to play. The crowd wouldn't allow yeah. us to not play them. So it is a bit of a struggle to write a set list for us because what do you leave out? Um, and we only made that situation worse when we released Instant Pleasures in 2017 because there was quite a few good songs off that, which meant that older songs had to be pushed out of the way. But we're very lucky in the sense that we've got such a good strong fan base that just love coming to see us so i've noticed over the years that you know we can as i say there's probably songs that we can't not play but i get a joy out of playing whatever we do play because people come to see us and they treat it almost like a huge party a big night out and nearly every song we play they all sing sing every word back to us so there isn't any particular song as a rule that takes preference over another but you can't beat the feeling of playing Chasing Rainbows last and everyone just singing it back at you and then leaving the venue still singing it that's such a great experience and I mean that goes down to you know weekend gigs are always better because it's the weekend and everyone's letting loose but you know we can play in Blackburn on a Monday night and and the atmosphere is quite charged so it doesn't really even matter what night of the week it is with us which is which is a great feeling because on that album, the crowd participation on Chasing Rainbows, I bet it just gives you goosebumps when you play it live and hear, hear all of them singing it back to you. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's, a, it's, it's just, it's great that something that we just sat and wrote a long time ago still resonates with people. You know, I mean, we hear stories that when we play that in London, there's people have left the venue, they've walked to the nearest tube station, they've got on the tube and they're still singing it. <laughs> which is quite a, quite a good thing. I, I should join those fans at some point and and, <laughs> and serenade them home. <laughs> Obviously, um, you have a lot of um, the great songs on that album, but uh, one of my personal favourites on that, it's obviously a great song by you anyway, but that intro to Disco Down is just amazing. Yeah, we do like to kind of change things more for, for us as well to have a little bit of fun. You know, every, every tour we do, we kind of decide one of them should perhaps start acoustically and build up into the full band or just change an intro or change an outro just for, just for our own pleasure as well as, as everybody else's. We've got some quite good ideas. There is talk that we might be going on tour at the end of this year. I can't say for sure yet, but people are talking about it. And we've got some, if that does happen, there's some quite novel ideas uh, to add into that pot. So fingers crossed it'll happen and, uh, and we can go and test the water. That's, uh, that would obviously be brilliant. And as you say, um, you like to switch it up a bit. That, uh, that cover of um, I Am The Resurrection, that is another one that is... Yeah, brilliant. quite a brave move for the rest yeah. of the game the band that isn't it really especially because we did that at Castlefield Bowl in Manchester and then we did it when we played in Manchester in 2019 it's, it's obviously that's where they're from so it's quite a bold move I mean it, to be honest it's a good thing for me because I can just leave the stage for five minutes yeah. and nip outside <laughs> and have a quick tab so, <laughs> so it works for me as well don't know the rest of the band for that um, hard um, guitar part and yeah, well, I think they wouldn't even consider it if they knew they wouldn't be able to do it any justice. You know? and, and they do do it well. So, you know, we've got a second career as a Stone Roses tribute band, haven't we? Yeah, if, 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 if that ever comes to it, that is. I'll have to start doing that. <laughs> yeah, swing, swinging <laughs> the mic. <laughs> Obviously, Shed Semper's been a massive success for you as a band. Is there anything you like touring about that time of year specifically? Say that again, Baker, sorry. Is there anything um, as a band that you like touring that time of year when it's December for Shed Center? Yeah, we, we kind of stumbled upon that because we'd, we'd kind of stopped being a band for a few years and then realised that we just really missed playing live. So we just thought, right, I'll tell you what, why don't we, why don't we put three or four gigs on sale at the beginning of December? Uh, this was going back to 2007, this because we'd had like a four year hiatus and, and we kept friendly and we all live in York. So it's quite a small, a small city really. So we just thought, right, we really missed that 
buzz of playing live because that's why we started the band in the first place to get our instruments get on a stage and show off to people you know so we just thought let's put let's put three or four gigs on and then we announced that and it just went a bit crazy people were saying right you need to upgrade your venues because ticket demand's high and you need to add more gigs up and down the country so that three or four gigs at the beginning of december is a one-off thing suddenly became an every other year big tour for us and which is we're still doing now the weird thing is that was 2007 and we're now in 2021 so 14 years we've been doing this and when we were in shed seven originally that was 1990 and we split in 2003 so that's only 13 years so we've actually been going longer now since reforming to do that little tour than we were as an original band in the 90s which is weird so yeah we find ourselves doing that it, it just seemed to work at christmas for some reason i think the, the combination of uh people winding down for christmas holidays you know uh people getting excited because christmas is around the corner that kind of i don't know dark cold outside everyone's inside having a great time in a sweaty venue it just kind of works so it just stuck and and that's what we continue to do and to the point where people do call it shed summer have you got any certain venues you love playing on these tours well again that kind of goes back to what i said about having such a great crowd and, yeah. and playing in places on a monday night as opposed to a weekend night there isn't really because it's what's happening inside that room yeah. that matters and i think the atmosphere is always electric i mean obviously playing the brixton academy is a great venue and the glasgow Barrowlands is a brilliant venue but you know ooh, could play a gig in my house if the atmosphere was right it'd just be brilliant no i'm not suggesting we're ever going to do that <laughs> <laughs> you like you you like you'll have um all, all sorts of fans coming around your house now and expecting yeah well I, I don't gig this year there i don't want five thousand people in my house it's not big enough maybe in the garden <laughs> <laughs> being in a band must have meant you must have had some great memories being on the road obviously whether it be current day or in the 90s have you got a most memorable or funniest moment from touring with shed seven baker i get told things quite a lot do you remember that and i never remember any of it it was the 1990s man what do you expect i'm sure there's been absolutely loads of brilliant stuff and off the top of my head i can't th really think of anything but yeah there's loads you know we're just very lucky that we've managed to to hit people and and leave a lasting impression musically of course i mean um oh, there's just loads of stuff's happened over the years but I need to be prompted because my brain's a bit dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I can actually recall Noel Gallagher saying a couple of years ago in an interview, if you remember the 90s, you weren't there. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like what they said about the 60s, isn't it, really? Uh, so, I mean, I feel quite, it's quite an honour to, to have been a part of that in some shape or form. And, you know, because I think the, the Brit Poppy kind of movement to give it a word um it's probably going to be the last big musical movement really and sadly because of the nature of the industry now it's totally changed you know it, i can't really ever foresee a time where a newsreader on the 10 o'clock news is going to say who's going to be number one out of yeah. these two ones you know and i can't ever see that happening which is a shame really um because it used to happen a lot um so yeah i think i feel kind of proud that we were part of that last huge musical movement really and obviously you get your new indie bands coming through these days but it's ju it's just a shame because when, when you look back at the 90s and i don't know if you ever watched the repeat top of the pops is on friday nights but it, it's just it, just when all the indie bands were going head to head it, it just doesn't look like it'll ever be the same again like you say well i think i think I think indie bands will still prevail and do good. It's kind of like swings and roundabouts, really. Scenes come and go. Yeah. And I think there will become a time again where people will want to hear indie-ish guitar bands again as a big thing. But I just can't ever see it being as huge as it was. But, you know, I, th I do think if you're in an indie band now and you've, you've written some good indie tunes, 
just push it and keep doing it because I think you will there will be a time where the need will be there for that again and there is a lot of good indie bands out there but they have gone a bit more underground again because of the current situation but you know I mean if you're good enough you'll crack through that and this leads me on because you do help with your brilliant radio show Rick Witter's Disco Down every, yes. su- every Sunday night 7 till 9 which you play your favourite indie songs um, you also play a game where you get listeners to tweet in with um, a song with the word of your choice. You also do play demos from artists who want the song shared. Could you tell yeah. people a little bit more about this? Well, as you've rightly said, it's Sunday evening, seven till nine on Yorbit Radio, which is why that's written there. Yeah. Uh, because I think the last thing I did was speak to Fran Healy out of Travis when I was doing my show and I forgot to put that back. So yeah, I interview uh people who perhaps want to come on and on zoom and do it up, um and and it goes out live on air so i've had a few good indie types on that uh yeah i think of a word this is i do this because i like to have the interaction with the listeners yeah. really and rather than just go all oh, right this is the stone roses with mercy paradise and then when that's played come back and right this is travis with whatever you know i like to have that kind of in between song laugh with the listeners so I think of a word and then I invite people to tweet me or text into the show with songs they know of with that word in the title and then just take the mickey out of people for for sending in really rubbish song ideas but you know it kind of works I think people quite like it and then yeah I do play I invite people bands who are unsigned to send in their their most recently recorded song and then I'll big them up because the, I remember the first time we were played on the radio and it was such a great thing to listen to us on the radio it was a massive thing so if I can give bands the opportunity to get played on the radio and help spread the word for them then why not and I'm aware that you have an email address as well for Yorvik Radio where they can email if the one yep. to send the songs in and if they've heard about it from listening to you on this today then yeah yeah uh, I can't remember what it is off the top of my head uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, I can't remember if you go to my website you can probably find it there um, but yes just be aware if any bands want to do that I, I play one a week so I have got quite a big backlog of songs and I'm just sifting through them by order because I find that's the fairest thing to do and I'll put that in the link if anyone wishes to. Thanks, Ben. And um, obviously you have your amazing knowledge, which you tell people what happened on <laughs> this day in music back in um, whatever year it was and whatever day. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I do this uh, on this day in music. Um, yeah, where because obviously there's been a lot of big events. So I do my show every Sunday evening. So whatever date that is, like it was the 14th last Sunday, wasn't it? So what? So we might find that George, boy George, on this day uh, in 19 or 2002, boy George tied a male escort up to his radiator in his flat in New York and got arrested for it, <laughs> which did genuinely happen on one of the Sundays. So. But I might I might be telling a little porky by saying I just know all of this stuff off the top of my head. There might be a little bit of Google involved, but don't tell anybody because I'm just very clever. You, could, if anyone was listening from ITV, they could actually think you might have the boots for a chaser. <laughs> yeah, well, I did recently um, go on a celebrity pointless. Uh, I can't really say anything other than that, but it'll be shown later on this year. So you can see how thick I am when it, when, it, when that goes out on the telly. Um, right, Rick, we've had a few fan questions. Oh, dear. It's from uh, Gemma Tomasi. I can see what she's done here. She's managed to catch you out and get you to answer the question. You all <laughs> have to be. She wants I to will know, be the judge of this. What is your favourite airport, she wants to know. <laughs> Yeah, she has caught me out there, hasn't she? Yeah. Um, well, this all this that reason why she's asking that question is because on one of my early radio shows, I was having a discussion about Copenhagen, and I discussed what a lovely airport it is, uh, and then that made me think, right? Well, if I'm discussing airports, 
every guest I have on for the, for the, for the future, I will ask them what their favourite airport is as, as an opening line. Because I think doing interviews, because I've been interviewed so much over the years, if I'm interviewing other front men or women, I kind of know what what is a little bit less boring to ask. Yeah. I don't want I don't want to ask them about the new song. You know what I mean? Probably I'll I'll make sure people are aware they've got a new song and go and listen to it. But I'd rather know what the favourite airport is. So in that respect, I'll stick with my first answer and say Copenhagen because it is a lovely airport. So uh, that's that, and also Mike Mellor wants to know. Could Shed 7 bring out any new material at some point? I never said never, ever. <laughs> Going for gold. <laughs> uh, there's always the opportunity. Instant Pleasures was a bit of a happy accident, to be honest. We weren't really even considering writing anything new at that point. We just accidentally did it. And it just happened to be quite good. So, you know, it was a mammoth undertaking for us because... Um, a lot of members of the band do other things. So Shed 7 isn't our main creative output uh, since 2007. So, you know, the, there is always the option of doing something, but the, the problem is it would have to be as good on, if not better than Instant Pleasures, because what is the point in writing anything just to release something, just which could potentially damage your back catalogue? So there's always ideas flying around. I'm always thinking of words. I'm always jotting stuff down. Uh, obviously, not being able to see the rest of the band hasn't helped in the last year and a half. That's slowed everything down. Um, because we do like to get together and just jam and, and work out ideas. And it's not so much fun doing it via Zoom or emails. Yeah. So, you know, it took us 16 years between our last album and Instant Pleasures. So it could take us 32 years to do the next one. But if, if it takes that, it takes that. <laughs> and still touring with the Shed Sambas. Yeah, when I'm 82. This one leads on to a Shed Samba. Right, get prepared for this one. This one is from Chris Fountain. And I'll just state that my family do know Chris. And just picture someone drunk at uh, the Middlesbrough gig, Shed Samba 2019. He wants to know, can you remember him throwing his shoes? Right, well, Chris, is it? Yeah. Chris, 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 Chris. I mean, it does, I do have a vague memory of that, but it's not, it's not the first time that's ever happened, yeah. to be honest with you. And I always wonder, do they bring a spare set of shoes in a bag? Because they're going to throw the shoes. Do they walk home barefooted? You know, I have actually confiscated things off people in the past. Um, in fact, funnily enough, we played a gig in Liverpool about six years ago and a shoe came up onto the stage. And at the end of the song, I picked it up and said, who threw this shoe? And I'm, I'm kind of looking out at a lot of Liverpoolians and there was two quite big blokes stood in the middle and one of them's going like that to the other one. So I'm kind of telling this chap off. What are you doing? What are you, what are you throwing your shoes on? So I'm keeping this till the end of the gig. It turned out it wasn't one of those two chaps. I don't know why he was doing that. Because uh, it was actually my wife. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he, he was trying he wasn't, to make it into trouble, really. Yeah, I think he was, yeah. And it wasn't her shoe she threw. I think she must have just discovered a shoe on the floor, which is a strange thing to find that isn't attached to somebody's foot. But, you know, I remember a time way back when where we were playing somewhere and there was a person right at the very front just on his phone having a chat to somebody while we were playing. So at the end of the song, I kind of picked him out and said, who are you talking to on your phone? And not only is it really loud, you look like you're having yeah. a proper conversation. So he told me, I think he said he was speaking to his mum or something, something ridiculous. So I confiscated that, took it off him, put it on the drum rise and said, you can have that back at the end of the gig. You got, you've come to listen to us, listen to us. <laughs> and he did actually get his shoes back to like in the middle between like the barrier, the stewards and uh -huh. the actual stage. So he, right. did get, he did get his Paul Smith trainers back. Right, look at him because I could have had them, could I? Yeah. Finally, Rick, it's been an abs absolute pleasure to have you on. 
a lot of people wanted to know this, but you did mention it earlier. What can we expect of a shed semba this year? If you can answer that, that is. Well, everyone who's been a few times will know exactly what they're going to get. I am a big believer in giving people what they want in the sense that there's just no point in playing really early rare B-sides because people just want to come, let their air down, have a sing-along and go home happy. So potentially if we get to do it, there will it will be very hit heavy. We'll, we'll cherry pick some different songs off Instant Pleasures that we've never played yet. Um, and uh, we might throw in a cheeky cover, but you, you, everyone should expect that they're going to hear all the songs that they would want to hear. And we are obviously hoping that would happen because that would be a fantastic way to end the year. And obviously, after the year that's happened, yeah, fingers crossed. If we're allowed, we'll do it. Fingers crossed. And thank you so much, Rick. It's been great. No worries, Baker. Thanks for the chat. Good, good stuff. Good luck with you and your podcast and everything. Thank you. Cheers. And, uh, and keep listening on Sundays. Of course I will, yeah. Huge thanks to Rick for coming on today and giving me his time. I've really enjoyed it and I hope you have too. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. See you next week.